Wait, are you... <laughs> are you gonna count me in? Whatever. I'm just gonna go for it. Welcome to the Queen's Lead Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Singleton. And as a child of the 80s, I'd love to say Queen's rule. But they don't. Queen's lead. Being a queen means you are worthy to be a leader of people. The guests on our show do exactly that. They are leading the way in their businesses, families, and communities. And they're taking their rightful place in the spotlight, leading and inspiring the developing queens in all of us. Welcome to the Queen's Lead Podcast. Now here's your host, Amy Singleton, the queen of realness. Leading conversations about business, life, and the real shit you want to know. Welcome everybody back to another episode of the Queen's Lead Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Singleton, and today I have Andrea Pass with Andrea Pass PR. She is a public relations specialist and a whole lot more. Andrea, welcome. Hi, Amy. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Would you please tell our guests a little bit more about you and your business? Well, I am a public relations professional. I have been in the public relations field for quite a long time. In fact, I was that person that was always the publicity chair back in high school and college. So it's really? always been in my blood that back in those days, you would write a press release and mail it to the newspaper, or you would go around town and you would hang up signs, or you would call a radio station or a TV station and say, can I book an interview for my client? Meaning the person I was working with at the high yeah. school in the club. So that really went on. And, and so I started my PR career at the CBS radio division in New York City because I wanted to be the next Dan Rather. Oh, and wow. uh, I realized I didn't want to be a broadcaster. I really wanted to be a publicist. And so then I pivoted to the agency side of things. I'm in my public relations lane, which means I secure press coverage for my clients. So that means I'm getting my clients coverage in magazines, newspapers, radio, TV, podcasts, blogs, Facebook Lives, LinkedIn Lives, anything that is editorial, media driven, not advertising. So yeah. PR is where it's all about for me. That's awesome. So let's kind of let's take it back before the PR, before owning your own business, before what's happening now. Tell me about little girl, Andrea. Oh, goodness. I always like to talk. <laughs> little girl, <laughs> Andrea, was always that person that had something to say. And I love being part of the committee and sharing things and doing things. So no matter when it was, I'd always try different things. But I always like to be part of an organization, part of a group, part of something that you could say, wow, this got done and, and I helped do it. So even when I was little, Andrea, those things always happened. And I guess you don't even realize when you're younger, the things you love to do. And as yeah. much as I love giving an interview, being involved, I love it even more when it's my client. I become giddy with excitement when my client is quoted, when my client is featured. and so. It's been part of me forever, but I always loved all of that. And always, little Andrea, I love being with my family and friends. To this day, there's nothing that matters more to me than being with my family, my friends, and my colleagues. That's what matters. Where Where did you grow up? I grew up in the town I live in now. Oh, so really? I'm one of those people. Yes, Same I live for me. I live forever. in a small town in North Jersey. And um, and this town, actually, the part of town I grew up in called Radburn was the first planned community in the United States. Originally, when it was, you know, constructed almost 100 years ago, there were no streets to cross to get to the shopping, to the parks, to the school. Everything was via pathways so that no one had to cross streets. And so I grew up in this uh, just beautiful community that had parks and playgrounds and pools and and a planned community that my mother would hand me money and say, oh, you know, go to the grocery store and get this. And you didn't have to worry that I had major streets to cross to get to the grocery wow. store. Even then, when the streets started coming in, they were local. And so 
living in the town I grew up in, my children even went to my elementary school, my middle school and my high school. So it's it's kind of funny. I never thought I'd live here and I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, coming from such a small town, it's like, it's interesting that you ended up in such a kind of worldwide or global type of work. Um, no, you said you never thought you'd end up living there. Did you, did your life take kind of a detour where you ended up back home? Not really. Uh, my husband and I moved away when we first got married. And then when we were thinking about having children, all I could think about was my town was perfect for having children. Uh, where we live is 20 minutes from New York City. Oh, so wow. it's so easy. In fact, my husband and I worked in New York City and we would take trains into New York City. And to this day, we take the bus in when we want to go to the theater or we have a meeting. So mm -hmm. the convenience of New York City and the benefits of suburbia are perfect when you live in North Jersey. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I I love that area. Like I just um I don't know. I feel like it's got just a little bit more attitude, you know, that like people are just like ready to go up there. So like I get asked all the time, are you from back east? And I'm like, no, I'm from Oklahoma. Same as you. I've lived been born, lived, raised right within about a 10 10 mile square radius my whole life, actually, right here in Oklahoma City. But um so so um where did your where did your adult life take you first in like corporate America? So when I was in college, I had wanted to be Dan Rather. So when I graduated college, okay, and I'm not giving away my age, but you could tell from looking at me, I'm not a youngster. I had my <laughs> navy blue suit with the shirt that had the tie attached to it. Yes. Okay, and my little navy blue pumps. And my parents bought me a brown briefcase with my initials engraved on it. And so wow. off I go on the train into New York City with my printed resume that, you know, you didn't have a printer at home or a computer at home. I had to have it printed at a print shop yeah. you know, <laughs> on cream paper with a certain stock. And uh, off I went to CBS in New York City. I'm a wow. hot shot. I'm just walking in. I go right to the human resources department. I hand them my resume. I fill out an application. And they say, OK, you have to take a typing test. Every woman back then had to take a typing test. Wow. And because they were going to put you in a secretary position, right? Like they were no. going to put you on air. It's the real life anchorman. Is it? it is. It is. But what's so funny is I uh, there was a freeze in the broadcast area. And back in the day, CBS owned magazines. So I got a job at Woman's Day magazine which is now defunct, but it was one of the seven sisters. It was one of the top magazines. I remember and Woman's Day. I was yeah. an administrative assistant for six weeks. And six then, weeks? Yep. Then I got promoted and oh, I was doing wow. advertising trafficking and then promoted again that I was actually doing the advertising layout for the magazine with film and measuring the film to a 16th of an inch, which is why I wear glasses now. Um, <laughs> and until the freeze was lifted in the broadcast area and I got a job doing public relations for the CBS radio division. Wow. And I, I loved public relations and I loved getting stories in the press about our, our anchors, our personalities, things that were being broadcast by the CBS radio division nationwide. But I also realized after a few years, there was nowhere to go. It was me and my boss. And believe it or not, she just retired recently. So I never would have gotten her position. And I realized I loved variety. So I went to the agency side of things and worked in the public relations agency side up until I started Andrea Pass Public Relations a number of years ago. So I always worked for someone else. Their name was on the door. I became the vice president of media relations at a number of public relations firms. But then there just came a point that it was time. It was time for me to go out, do me, not work with other people, not have any interns or any newbies, take on clients I wanted to work with and who wanted to work with me and, and have a great life work balance. And uh, as opposed to the balance being work and life, 
And so yeah. <laughs> I realized I, I, I hit a certain stage and a certain age and I know I'm good at what I do. My clients are thrilled. I'm securing press for them. But I also know there has to be time. I, I go out with my parents once a week for lunch. Dad is 91. Mom is 86. They live on their own around the block. Oh, wow. I would never. I take them to doctor's appointments. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, to be able to to have that flexibility to see a client, go to a meeting, maybe meet up with my parents for lunch. That's the benefit of being a solopreneur. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think we said whenever we first spoke that you were like going, I never saw myself as an entrepreneur. Can you can you talk a little bit about like when you I mean, you you kind of said like I came to a certain age, a certain yeah. stage. But I mean, were there other examples in your life of entrepreneurs? What what was it that kind of finally pushed you over the edge out of that corporate world where you had the I mean, like the the bravery, bra brevity to say, like, here we go. Like, I'm going to yeah. jump. You yeah. know, you know, it, it, it really is amazing because I was very successful in my public relations career working for other people. And at one point, uh, my clients loved me. I had a great staff, but I had a bully boss. And myself and the other vice president, we used to joke that we would have been skinny if you burn calories crying. Oh, because gosh. this bully boss tried to reduce us to, to nothing. He pretty much success uh, was successful with my colleague. Uh, she is no longer in public relations. He really did a number on her. I would not let him do a number on me. No matter what I did and what success I had and my clients were thrilled, he found fault with it. And it's like, yes. That's Queen Spike. He ain't Queen doing Spike. a number on me. Not on me, boss not, Buster. <laughs> no way. But it took me eight and a half years till I finally got the courage yeah. to leave and go get another job. And I left. I met our competitor, another PR firm at a conference. And I waited till he said, oh, I have to go to my room to take a call. And I made a beeline for this booth and said to the owner, you know, hi, are you? So-and-so, of course, I knew she was. I said, you know, I'm Andrea Pass. She says, I know who you are. I said, can you step away from your booth to talk to me? Because I didn't want to be seen there. And I said, I'm looking forward to uh, making a career change. And she said, oh, can you start on? And she gave me a date. That's how it happened because my reputation in public relations preceded me. And so within seconds, I had this job that was starting in a few months. And wow. I knew I could leave. But leaving was, he put me through hell, you know, just you, do you didn't think do at first you said he, and then you said she was, was that the difference? No, no, I don't think so. I think this particular man was just horrible to any women. And I don't think all men are. And I've worked with other men in my career and have not felt that way. Most of my bosses have been women. Um, which is very different, but, uh, but no, I don't think it was, it, it was a male thing. It was more him and, and he, he was just a bully, raised his children to be bullies. And, um, and, and so I had to escape, but when I went to the other place and I was happy there for a while, but I also found that the staff were leading a very different lifestyle. They'd they were supposed to work eight to four. I'd come and visit. They were in California. I was in New Jersey. I'd go visit a few times a year to work from the office. And they would traipse in at 820, 840, and at 910, leave for a Starbucks, then gab, the phone would ring, emails weren't returned. It just wasn't me. Yeah. And so when, when that was ending, and I had so many clients that said, Andrea, why are you not working for yourself? And I couldn't find an answer as to why. There was a fear. Okay. I mean, let's be honest. It, it is terrifying. And I say to people who are thinking of going into business for themselves, I was lucky and am lucky. Our insurance is through my husband's company. If you cannot afford health insurance in the United States on your own, you may be, maybe you shouldn't be an entrepreneur because you need insurance. In our world, it's an opinion I have. Many other people disagree. They don't have health insurance. I respect everyone's choices, 
I believe it's very important to have health insurance. And so I was able to go on my own. And within days, I had my first client and he bought me my first box of business cards. In fact, he bought me my second box as well. And awesome. within three weeks, I was turning people away. Wow. And it's been this steady stream of interesting clients ever since. And so you're right. I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur. And like, hey, look at me now. It's cool. Yeah. it's cool. So when you were working in the the agency world, were you who were your clients? Were they like bigger corporations or you're working with individuals? And how what does that look like now versus when you were like with the agency side? Yeah, in the agency side, I was dealing with companies, companies that were over that billion dollar mark, uh, companies that had staffs of 50 to 100 employees. But even when I was representing those companies, I was always in touch with the CEO. I was always booking interviews and traveling with the CEO. Yeah. And then there were smaller kind of kind of clients or smaller departments when I represented a few universities. True, they're huge universities, but you worked with their marketing department, who ha whoever handled public relations, and you had a few professors that you would be responsible for, not an entire school worth of professors. So yeah. it still made it, uh, the, the bigger clients smaller. So I had those kind of clients and uh, my favorite clients, I represented a number of businesses in the as seen on TV category. All those cool gadgets from infomercials, but wait, there's more. Yeah. And I loved it. We would travel around the country and we would hold pitch-a-thons where at-home inventors would come and pitch their gadget in the hopes that the company would sign a contract with them and make that gadget and sell it as an as seen on TV product. So oh, yeah. it was that's so fun. So were you were you traveling and working with Kevin during that time with Kevin Harrington? No, I know Kevin. Whole, oh, okay. Yeah, I know Kevin. Uh, I met with Kevin many a time, but. Yes, Kevin and I were in the same world. However, my world was a successful ongoing world where clients yeah. were selling a lot of products. Clients were successful with current and future products. Uh, they weren't just talking the talk. They were walking the walk. It was both ends of, of, of everything. And my clients were featured on television, uh, newspapers, magazines all over the country because of my public relations outreach efforts. So, so it was so it was fun, 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 fun. And I think uh, because of my relationships, I met Chef Wolfgang Puck. And I represented wow. Chef Puck for quite a while. And he was also a wonderful person to travel with, doing press interviews, to the point he knew my allergies. <laughs> I mean, we, we were That's doing an funny. event um, at his restaurant in Detroit. And after the event, me and, and Chef Puck and another associate of his sat down for lunch. And Chef Puck told the, you know, the, the waiter, the staff person, whatever, oh, bring us this, 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 this. And I just kept my mouth shut. And the other gentleman said, Wolfgang, Andrea, Andrea. And he says, Andrea, I'm so sorry. He calls the person back. Instead, make the, he remembered every one of my allergies and food needs. Oh, wow. Like, so and he was a pleasure. I had to leave him um, in, in a bar area with my husband because my husband came to meet me. We were done with meetings and he and I were, I had my car. So my husband was coming home from New York City with me. But I had to go, you know, get the car validated from the front of the, the hotel. And so I left my husband alone. My husband's looking at me like, oh, no, I'm being left alone with Chef Wolfgang Puck. I got back, the two of them, gabbing, 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 as if they had <laughs> like BFFs forever. That's the kind of person Wolfgang Puck is. That's funny. And, you know, the more people, like Kevin has been a mentor to our mastermind group with Hype for, for several years now and um, is actually coming to an event we're hosting in Arkansas in um, April of this next year. Um, and we worked with him and Damon John and several of the Sharks. But what I've learned just to your point about your husband and Wolfgang is, you know, and like um, whether it's Kevin Harrington or Damon John or Willie Robertson from Duck Dynasty or John Maxwell, who mentors our mastermind group once a month personally, no matter how high a person gets, like 
when we're looking at them as like some kind of celebrity, they are just people like they are so relatable. They are so down to earth. And I feel like that's kind of a really great transition into talking about PR because showing who these people are, I think it's a really, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like we're in such a different environment than we were when I was a kid. I'm 43 years old. And so like when in the, in the early eighties and all pretty much throughout most of the nineties, we were told by an announcer what to believe. We were told by TV or by the news, you know, it wasn't, we weren't in the information age yet. And so PR looked very different back then than it does now. And you've been in it for a really long time. So tell me if I'm right in, in, in assuming that PR today is so much about showing who that person really is and a lot of transparency. Cause I feel like that's something that's way different than back in the early eighties announcer age where there was zero transparency. Yeah. I think that, you know, it, it ain't your grandma's PR anymore at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the world has changed so much and because it's so fast yeah. and because there are so many, uh, journalists and homegrown journalists out there and everyone has a message and I think that for my clients and I know for my clients they have to stay true to their message their belief their story the reason they want to tell their story so that others will purchase their service their product their book donate to their nonprofit whatever it might be mm -hmm. uh, but there was no fact checking back in the day, this is what you believed is fact. And I remember uh -huh. one of my clients got off an interview and I, I think he quoted something being 14,000 of something. And the number was really 16,000 and got off the interview and realized it and panicked to me. I said, don't worry about it. No one's going to know the difference between 14,000 and 16,000. Yeah. But today, yeah. someone will know the difference. Someone is saying that's not that's not the fact. I fact check that people who do fact check. And I'm always impressed when you see here's the fact check of an interview. This is the reality. And these are the facts. And, yeah. and I think that honesty is the best policy in in doing interviews, no matter who you are representing. I mean, for Andrea past public relations, I'm representing a wide range of small businesses. I'm not representing. A, a politician or or someone who reports to a compliance department from a major financial institution or traded publicly on the stock exchange. Um, mm -hmm. My clients are smaller, which I happen to like. I You're really like trying to represent people. <laughs> not at all. No, not at all. I had someone reach out to me and said, "You're not aiming, you know, high enough." I said, "I'm aiming where I want to aim. Yeah. I have control." And I can decide who I want to work with, who I don't want to work with, who I'm going to aim for, because I've paid my dues. And I, I, I can do that. And that's what I love about having my own PR consultancy, is that if we click, yay, let's work together. If we don't click, it's okay. Toodaloo. Not right. everyone's going to be everyone's cup of tea. And that's okay with me. But the difference in public relations today is so much of it is pay for play. Mm -hmm. I hate it mm -hmm. because of the fact that then that what was once editorial content says sponsored by, yeah. which yeah. means it's advertising content. It might be an interview, but it's not the same. So anyone can pay for pay for play content. I'm not a believer. The only yeah. time that I do recommend it for clients is if they've never done an interview before and they want to be in a TV studio, they want that feeling under the lights, we're on, let's do it, let's pay money for one just so that we have something to show for ourselves so we can improve. Mm -hmm. Through Andrea Past Public Relations, I do media training with my clients. Not everyone knows how to do an interview. Yeah. You need to learn how to do an interview. And, and move the interview the way you want it to be moved. However, pay to play gives you an opportunity to provide the questions so you're answering the questions you've written. True, so true. I'm, not, I'm not a fan of pay to play, but everyone is looking to make a buck. 
And, you know, it used to be, it used to be that being quoted in Forbes really meant something. But now if I, it, being in marketing and knowing what I know, if I see that you've been quoted in Forbes, I'm like, oh, great. Sure. Cool. Good for you. You're in a two comma club. Good for you. Like you paid for this beautiful thing. You know, I mean, even that when I was in high school, I remember getting inducted into the who's who among high school students. And just recently I had people reaching out. Oh, Amy, Me you're too. supposed to be I who's who of the business owners. And I'm I like, got that too and then you ago. get to, Right. You get to the end and they're like, OK, which package do you want? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not paying you to be for all the crap I've done, like for you to promote the things I've done. If you want to do that, great. You know, I, I understand when there is a cost associated with um, being published, you know, or like whereas there is a physical cost to a book or something, maybe where you're contributing and you're and you're contributing to uh, the, the cost of something. But but to just pay for you know, a backlink on someone's website to say that you were quoted in Forbes is totally and completely different. Um, and as you said, to your point, when it's paid, it's really advertising. So can you speak a little bit to the difference of, I think there's a big mis misunderstanding. A lot of people come to me for PR. I'm in advertising. I'm in, uh, you know, I'm in the digital marketing space, not marketing space, not in necessarily the PR space, which is different, right? Like when we're doing Very. SEO on a website, of course, we're putting out press releases. We're putting out, you know, online. But what you do is so much different than advertising. So can you kind of like delineate the difference for it for the listeners? In public relations, uh, the journalist controls the content. You control your answers, but that doesn't mean that all of your answers will make it into that story or that interview. Okay. Mm -hmm. In advertising, you've paid for that. You control all of the content. It is your words. In public relations, you are getting facts. You are getting information from a reputable journalist. In advertising, the audience is skeptical because it's an ad. They know oh, it's God. an ad. Those are the main differences in public relations, especially with the growth of podcasts. There is now more of a long form format to be able to tell a business story. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in uh, advertising, you'd have to buy a full page ad. Maybe you can buy an article that says sponsored by, and they know it's advertorial, but mm -hmm. there's a difference in public relations, when you do an interview or your product is reviewed by a, a, you know, a media outlet or what have you, that's evergreen content that you can use over and over and over again on your social media. So a public uh, relations person like me can be providing <clears throat> you or your clients with editorial content for you to use on social to boost their SEO. So there's really this hand in hand, but the categories are so different. But what's most important is you don't need to be Bill Gates or, or Warren Buffett or Kim Kardashian to afford public relations. Mm -hmm. Public relations is affordable. I just got off the phone with, with a book author earlier today. She's a solopreneur. She has a book. I can do PR for her for a reasonable amount versus the entire amount for my six month public relations campaign would not even buy her a quarter of a page glossy ad. So mm -hmm. it's important to look at your dollars and cents and make sure that you have public relations and marketing in your budget because you need both because I hear from people and I'm sure you do as well, Amy. Well, no one knows about us. Well, are you out there? How is someone going to know about you, your business, your product, your book, your service, if you're not out there communicating to new audiences? Mm -hmm. And public relations introduces you to new audiences. That's where there's a huge differential. How can, so I, I totally understand using public relations when you're an author or a speaker or maybe even like a new product, right? Like getting, um, but, but what about a service-based business? You know, what about an attorney or a, the local plumber? Like how can these people start to use public, public relations to their benefit? Anyone can secure press coverage and use it 
over and over again. Example, I'm working with a virtual assistant company out of Virginia. Okay, they provide virtual assistants that are college educated, US based. Very different. If you learn about mm -hmm. virtual assistants, they tend to be um, from the Philippines, from India, from different countries. These are US based, college educated. So we have the owner doing interviews explaining the differences in what virtual assistants do, how she came to start her business after surviving burnout from a corporate job, and how being a virtual assistant allows stay-at-home moms to have a career. Um, so, so by keeping her in the media, people are learning about her agency and reaching out to her. Another service-based company, I represent, believe it or not, a number of funeral homes. What wow. their goal and the goal of our campaign is to educate others to pre-planning their funeral. It helps your loved ones. Unfortunately, the only thing we can count on in life are taxes and death, <laughs> as Ben Franklin said. So I don't want it's his quote. But right. but the bottom line is, if you are uh, pre-plan your funeral, then it's one less thing for your family to have to worry about. So we are getting national press, even though the funeral homes are located in a certain demographic area in the country, we are helping everyone nationwide by getting the yeah. word out. So whether you are a, um, I have another client who is a fractional uh, CFO, I, you know, it, products, services, it, it's, I have someone who's uh, doing social media content. Her clients could be anywhere around the country. So you look at all of these and you can be service based and be quoted in articles. Uh, just today, I'm working with a registered dietitian and uh, we just got her quoted in the story coming out on Yahoo. So it really is a variety of things that service based businesses can be quoted, featured, included to increase name recognition so that someone reads about them, sees them, hears them, and says, wait a minute, I'm going to reach out to that that business. Yeah. So, okay. So tell us, um, and we're getting close to, to our time. So I wanted, I want to be able to leave the listeners with something. Um, what is something that like a new business owner, maybe they're a solopreneur, they have a, a new small business. What's something they can do on their own to start getting more press coverage? Get to know your local weekly throwaway newspaper. Mm. Invite them over, go for a meeting so that they know what you're doing. Join your chamber of commerce mm -hmm. and become a speaker. When you are a speaker, have someone record it, post it on social. Write a chapter in a book. There are so many opportunities. You don't have to write the whole book, yeah. but write, yeah. write a chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, and then promote that. You wrote that chapter in that book. So for very hyper local businesses, the local plumber, the local beauty salon, that's the best way for you to get press coverage. But mm -hmm. if you're the local plumber that also on your site sells parts, well, suddenly you're not local anymore. Mm -hmm. You're regional or you're national. If you're the local salon or spa, but you have lotions or hair supplies or whatever that you're selling, mm -hmm. you are no longer local. So take a step back to recognize, are you really as hyper-local as you think you are? Or are you a bit bigger than you think you are? So start with that local. But the best thing to do, listen, I hired an accountant. I'm not good at numbers. Okay, my accountant takes care of all of that. I hired someone from my social media. I am not great at, at social. There are times where you have to invest. And public relations, what I do, and marketing, what you do, are things that you should invest in. So if you have a budget or spend the budget, you will get the money back. One sale will pay for me, will pay for you. Yeah. So, exactly. so I, I recommend, can you do some things on your own? You can, but when you're working with a professional, it's being done right. What it's like, what is it like to work with you for our public relations? If you are that local hair salon, the local plumber, the local service provider, attorney or something, what would what would that engagement with you look like? When people hire Andrea past public relations, they're hiring me 
not someone else. I am only taking a handful of clients because I really love that life work balance. And I am communicating effectively. I had a prospective client call me yesterday. Their event is in less than two weeks. I said, I'm not getting any press for you. Okay. We would have needed to start four to six weeks ago. Yeah. And I said, I can get you post interviews. We can talk about your, your product after the fact of this event. Uh, that could lead up to your next event, which is in a month. There are ways to do that. But, but hire someone who knows what they're talking about. So what I do is I am in communication. I say to my clients on emails, here's an interview. It's, you have a choice of this day, this day, or this day. Let's do media training on this day. Let's book it. Or I specifically need an answer to this question. You know, an example is the registered dietitian. One of my contacts uh, wrote to me and said, do you know anyone who could comment on this topic on nutrition? Oh, yeah. Happen to have someone. By working with a public relations professional, we have connections, but we also know how to research the connections. Do, do I know everybody? No. How can anyone know everybody? But I know how to find them. Yeah. So clients who work with me know that I am becoming a part of the team. I'm becoming part of the family. I am looking out for my clients' best interest. I am not ghosting them. I am in touch all the time. Even when I'm on a vacation, I've talked in Mexico. I've talked in Alaska. I was in London. Just recently, I was in Budapest, and I was back and forth texting with a client because I had to move an interview that the journalist had to change dates and times. And the client writes, aren't you on the Danube? I'm like, yeah, I'm in Budapest. <laughs> but this had to get changed. We're not waiting. We have to change yeah. it. But, but I am in touch, getting the job done, listening, but also making important recommendations to help you grow your business using press coverage. I love it. Well, tell me, uh, where can people find you? And I know you uh, you all have offered a 30-minute uh, consultation to anybody that that's just curious about PR to see if you might be the right fit to try and help them promote themselves. Um, where can they find that? Well, they can go to my website, andreapasspr.com. Go on the appointments tab, schedule time, but make sure you note that you learned about me from Amy and the Queen's Lead so that I know where you heard from me. I'm on LinkedIn, Andrea Pass. I'm on Facebook, Andrea Pass Public Relations. I'm on Instagram, Andrea Pass PR. Uh, but what's important to note is that I do charge for my services. I am not running a pro, pro bono business. Um, so I do charge for my services, but my fees are very reasonable for the result. So I would welcome that opportunity to talk to you about your your business, your service, your product, your book, uh, et cetera, because press keeps you in the news. I love it. Get in the news. Stay in the get news. In the and news. Hire, hire Andrea to help you get there. Andrea, thank you so much for being my guest. And thank you for being a queen that leads. We will have all of Andrea's links in down in the show notes. So um, go on over and check her out. Leave us a review if you like this content and let us know what you think about local PR. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, guys. The Queen's Lead podcast is recorded worldwide and produced by the kick-ass media team at the Height Digital Home Base in Nicaragua. Until our next episode, stay real queens and go lead. Remember to tap that follow and leave your review. For freebies and more real, inspiring content you love, go to amysingleton.net and connect with Amy on our socials at the real Amy Singleton. One more thing. This is the legal language, what my lawyer wrote and what I need to read to you. This podcast is presented for educational and entertainment purposes only. I am Amy Singleton, and I'm just your friend. Although I may speak to many on this show, I am not a psychotherapist, a business coach, a doctor, a CPA, a lawyer, or probably anyone who should be giving you professional advice. This podcast is not a substitute for a relationship with your doctor, coach, or any other licensed professional. Got it? Good. Now go be a queen and follow me at The Real Amy Singleton. <laughs>